next we have Ms. Jennifer Larson, the Deputy Assistant Secretary from the U.S. State Department. We're then joined by Warren King, the DCM, Ambassador to Australia, UAE. Professor Mehmet, President Ankasam, Turkey. And finally, we have Trit Kirikatnikom, the counselor from the Thai Embassy in the UAE. Thank you so much, and over to you, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, for this uh, uh, penultimate or final session of the uh, of, of, of this uh, wonderful conference, uh, depending on how we phrase it. Um, we have, um, I'm told, about an hour and a quarter. The session runs till four, uh, till five. Um, we'll close it with a few valedictory remarks from my side. Uh, but we have a wonderful uh, selection of speakers with us to give different perspectives. We'll also have the pleasure of uh, listening to uh, Mr. Donald Liu, uh, the Assistant uh, Secretary of State for South Asia, who's going to be joining us from Washington, D.C. Um, so uh, he's going to be joining us at 4. And so I think we, because we are starting a little bit behind, uh, behind our scheduled time, uh, we're going to start with two American perspectives. Uh, uh, Jennifer, let's start with you. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and then move on to, uh, to Donald. Okay. Yeah? Um, so good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Ambassador, for uh, for being the moderator of the session, and to my fellow panelists, um, and also to the organizers of the con of, of the conference, uh, the India Foundation, and of course our hosts, the United Arab Emirates. Um, happy Golden Jubilee! And uh, I also would like to note um, the Honorable uh, Minister. Member of Parliament, um, Ms. Aisha Khan, I, I think we are the only two women to be um, speaking during these past two days on this panel, so uh, I just had to note that. Um, but I'm really happy to see many, many delegates here, some of whom I know from, from before. And also what a pleasure it is really to be here in person. Um, my uh, Assistant Secretary, who will be joining us on video, um, is uh, you know, obviously is going to have a very you know, a very broad uh, perspective on on the um, on the South Asia and Indo-Pacific relationships that the United States enjoys. But um, just for me to also be here in person, I was speaking at lunch with some of my table mates just about how even though it's possible to do these things by Zoom or by others, just to be in the same room and to be hearing each other's voices for the first time in a long time has been really wonderful. And I think that the hotel and the organizers have done a superb job job of keeping us all healthy and safe. So I really thank you for that. Um, but, okay. thank you. So the office that I lead at the State Department covers India, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Maldives, and Bhutan which is a recognition of not only the importance that are placed on the bilateral relationships, but also the, I'll say, it's the plural lateralism that, um, that Minister Jaishanka referred to yesterday, yesterday evening. Um, so many speakers so far have noted or suggested the dichotomy of COVID closing borders at the same time that there is the need for so much more interconnectivity really than ever before, whether it be through vaccine deliveries or the resiliency of supply chains. Um, I can tell you one of the most uh, current topics in the United States right now as we um, go into where we're in the middle of the big, what we call the holiday season, is just the disruption that's been caused by the past two years of the pandemic. And I would say that this, this supply chains and resiliency aren't things that you would normally see in mainstream uh, media being spoken about, you know, by your mothers and fathers in the past. It just shows you how, how close and how enduring the, um, the crisis has been. 
Um, I'm going to briefly just speak about some initiatives that the United States is involved with in the region uh, in the pursuit of an aim of the free, open, and rules-based Indo-Pacific. Um, one of which is, of course, as many of you have heard of, uh, the emerging quad, which my colleague from Australia, I'm sure, will also have something to say about, as will you, Ambassador, having just uh, shown me the article that you've published. Um, just over the past just almost year, our, our leaders have met together in person in Washington, D.C. just a short couple of months ago. We've had uh, a minister, uh, the uh, minister's summit we're planning for another ministerial to take place, uh, hosted in Canberra, we hope, uh, in February. Um, the Quad reaffirms uh, ASEAN centrality, uh, are the cooperation on COVID, on climate, new cooperation on infrastructure and cyber are all really exciting and important aspects of the uh, not of the bilateral partnerships that we share but also in this new um, this new uh, quadrilateral forum um, and I think the ambassador will probably speak to to what is emerging as another quad um, people call it I2U2 perhaps there's another better word but between Israel um, our host the UAE the United States and India uh, focusing on food security water energy transportation space and health utilizing the respective innovative, technological, productive capacities of the four countries, as well as the very skilled workforce. Um, I would say that in the global economy, in the economic recovery from the pandemic, the United States has remained committed uh, to the entire Indo-Pacific region. Um, the support for a free and, Indo, free and open Indo-Pacific has enabled increased American investment in the region, more fair and open trade relationships, and promoted reforms that have increased prosperity for Americans and people across the region. Uh, during the recovery from this challenging period, which we're still in, the importance of economic and commercial cooperation and partnership is paramount. Deepening commercial ties between the United States or U.S. companies and the Indo-Pacific will provide material benefits, including uh, to businesses small and medium-sized, in investors, workers, and consumers, not only in the United States, but in countries across the region. Um, I'd like to here refer to the Indo-Pacific Business Forum that was recently concluded with, for the first time, uh, with our partner, India. Uh, that was well, more than $6.5 billion in private investments were announced. And this was a totally virtual forum, um, like it had to be last year, but with 2,000 participants and 25 panels, I mean, really, really reinforced, I think, the United States' commitment to the region as a really trusted economic partner. Um, there are a couple of more that I'd just like to talk to about, which is one of which is the Infrastructure Transaction and Assistance Network, 14 U.S. government agencies collaborating to support quality infrastructure projects in the region, and the uh, Blue Dot Network, another example of how we use a positive approach to help partner countries improve infrastructure. And this was announced at last year's IPBF, um, and well, it, 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 actually not last year's, the year before in 2019 with Japan and with Australia. Um, and then the lastly, I would just note that at the Leaders' Summit on Climate in April 21, 2021, President Biden launched the U.S. Trade and Development Agency's Global Partnership for Climate Smart uh, Infrastructure, which is an initiative with U.S. industry and government partners that will deliver clean energy and transportation solutions to emerging markets around the world. Uh, this initiative advances U.S. TDA's dual mission of promoting U.S. jobs through exports and sustainable infrastructure in emerging markets and supports the development of clean energy and transportation infrastructure projects in the Indo-Pacific. And then I believe Ambassador Liu is going to talk a bit more about sort of the, the, the COVID and pandemic response that's been undertaken by the United States. But with that, I'll stop because I know that we don't have much time and there are several panelists here. And um, just I, I thank you for your attendance this afternoon again to the conference organizers for what's been really a great two days. So thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, we have time for a couple of questions for uh, Jennifer from the audience. Uh, is there anyone? Suhasini, I see your hand. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Suhasini Heather. I'm a journalist with the Hindu newspaper. Yesterday, right at this forum, External Affairs Minister of India, S. Jay Shankar, spoke about the exit of America. America's pullout from Afghanistan is one of the two most concerning developments for the Indian Ocean region, uh, the other one being the COVID pandemic. 
I wanted to ask if there was a sense now in the United States that uh, of the kind of impact uh, the developments in Afghanistan that were triggered by the U.S. pullout have really had on the region here, and are there discussions uh, with countries of the Indian Ocean region on how to uh, coordinate better on this. I had a second very short question, if I may. You, uh, you, uh, uh, later this week, there will be the Democracy Summit um, that is being chaired by President Biden. And um, we, we, we noticed that in South Asia, while India, Pakistan, uh, Nepal, and Maldives are invitees, other democracies like Sri Lanka and Bangladesh are not. Is there a reason for that? Thank you. Sure. I'm happy to answer both of those. So the answer to the first question is is yes. I mean, I, I think that there's been a there was a, a, certainly a, an understanding of and a growing realization that um, we absolutely had to have to keep partners uh, in the region uh, very well in just just kept very close in in terms of what's taking place. Well, during the the uh, withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, and certainly now, as we are each uh, evaluating our own relationships and what we can or cannot do with uh, with the Taliban, and if India is certainly a trusted and, and uh, confidant on this, as Jai, as Minister Jai Shankar mentioned yesterday. This is this is something that I think if we didn't understand before how closely we need to work with each other, we certainly do now. Uh, in terms of the summit for democracy. Um, there was there was actually un unfortunately a limit of countries that, that was uh, there may, may have been a bit of an arbitrary limit that had been placed. But um, so yes, not all of the countries in the region were have been asked to uh, to to join. Um, certainly, India is going to be playing a very very prominent role. But we would encourage those who weren't to continue to work on commitments to uh, democracy. We'd asked a number of the invitees to actually not to to talk with uh, with with others first about um, demonstrating commitments towards the uh, promotion of democratic ideals uh, globally. And then we encourage those who may not have been uh, part of this year's list to, to continue to work with us and for the next, uh, the next summit, which I believe is going to take place in two years. Any other questions? Ambassador Sajanha. Thank you, Navdeep. Uh, Jennifer, one question for you. You know, we see in the Indian Ocean region, there are two countries which have uh, sort of, uh, uh, you have put them in the same basket, Myanmar and Afghanistan. Now, with Afghanistan in Taliban, you are having discussions, you are having negotiations, you are having some contact uh, as to see how to move things forward. But as far as Myanmar is concerned, it is uh, being made to look like a totally a pariah state. You have nothing to do with that at all. Now, in terms of violence, you know what is observed here that uh, there is much more uh, violence and uh, destruction and death and mayhem in being uh, perpetrated in Afghanistan than comparatively in Myanmar. So uh, would you like to comment on that? Uh, meaning, shouldn't you also be opening some channels of communication conversation, dialogue with the Myanmar authorities also. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I, I really actually can't comment on what types of conversations are taking place between with, with the United States and Myanmar right now, but I mean, it's it, it certainly of, uh, we, we take certain notes of, um, you know, what is the, the and, and, and certainly with respect to, of course, our, you know, our, our partner in Bangladesh who has taken on, you know, a, a big burden for Myanmar in terms of the Rohingya refugees, 950,000 being hosted right now in, uh, in, in Bangladesh. So, I mean, suffice it to say that if there aren't, you know, direct communications taking place, we are working with our partners to talk to and about Myanmar on a continual basis. Um, while we're waiting for um, Ambassador Lou to join, let me use my prerogative sitting here to ask a question to Jennifer. Um, J Jennifer, the, the uh, recent meetings, uh, the virtual meeting of the uh, foreign ministers of India, UAE, Israel, and Secretary of State, um, what I have referred to as the West, West Asia Accord, as opposed to the Indo-Pacific Accord in the, uh, in the, in the South, um, one of the intriguing references that keeps coming up um, from Israel in particular, but also from, um, from Mr. Jashankar, is about transport infrastructure. And I've separately uh, tried to look at the possibility of uh, a kind of an India, 
Arab Mediterranean trade corridor uh, that takes you from Mumbai to uh, Jabal Ali in Dubai to via Saudi Arabia and Jordan into Haifa and then on. Is there any discussion taking place around the transport infrastructure part of it uh, at this stage? So I think at this stage, I mean, the, there's only been one sort of like, a, well, there was the initial call between the four ministers that you mentioned and that there, there was another um, kind of high level convening session that I believe took place on November 24th. And so the particulars of what's being talked about in infrastructure transportation, uh, I don't think are being worked out yet. But between now and uh, in March here in, in, in Dubai, actually, as part of the expo, when we do expect there to be a ministerial, I think we'll have more to say on that. And of course, I, I would note your, your special interest in the region, having been ambassador both here and as well as in Egypt. Uh, so um, I, I think that there's a lot of potential there. One short question from the audience. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, this subject of the ecology when we talk and the carbon signatures turning to the greens and, and blue economy, uh, the developing countries generally find constraints by the uh, financial resources and as well as technology. Whereas the fully developed countries have the full access to these two, how you feel that in near future, the developed countries coming forward to support the developing countries with the, these two things, that is the technology and some financial support. Because when we talk of the global, it is the global is both haves and have-nots. So is, is, do you visualize in near future something on those lines coming forward? So that, we, that I mean, the, the, the climate issues that you raise are, I mean, certainly we're, we're talked about at COP26 and, you know, when uh, we, I mean, I, who expected there to be a joint statement coming from China and the United States? I certainly didn't. But it, it's also a topic that we take within the quad as well as with the, well, both quads, I guess I'll say, with the, um, the, the, the quad the, with Australia, the United States, Japan and uh, India, as well as the one that's come up a little bit more recently. So I think, I mean, the United, we are one of the world's largest global greenhouse gas emitters. I mean, that's, and, and there's absolutely more that we have to do. I understand, uh, Swami, uh, Ambassador Lou has joined us. So can we, uh, can we have the screen on, please? A very warm welcome, uh, Ambassador John Lu from, uh, from the Indian Ocean Conference here in Abu Dhabi. And uh, we're delighted that you can, you're able to join us. I'm sure it's pretty early for you uh, in Washington, D.C. And, uh, and so thank you for making the effort, and we look forward to listening to you. Over to you, please. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, colleagues uh, who are here in the U.S. Good afternoon to friends in the UAE and throughout Asia. This COVID pandemic has touched the lives of all of us in ways we could never have imagined two years ago. My own stepfather uh, had COVID a year ago. He spent 10 days in the intensive care unit of his local hospital. Uh, he nearly died, thankfully he, he survived. So many of us have lost loved ones, have lost jobs, have lost time. When the Omicron variant was discovered just a week ago, a week ago, I know that I felt exhausted. I, I so much wanted this pandemic to be over, and now we face another period of uncertainty and possibly of closed borders, of closed economies, closed shops and restaurants. Our strongest weapon in facing this pandemic is international partnership. And it is inspiring that this Indian Ocean Conference has brought together leaders of 45 countries to talk about how we together can confront the greatest challenge of our generation. As I mentioned a week ago, South African epidemiologists identified and reported 
this new Omicron variant with a combination of mutations that could make it more transmissible and possibly allow it to evade immune protection of our previous infections as well as our vaccines. We commend South Africa for identifying the variant and acting so quickly to report to the WHO. It reminds us of the importance of working together as a global community to provide vaccine, to support healthcare workers, and to share scientific discovery. President Biden has outlined a vision for global action to end the pandemic based on four themes uh, in his global COVID-19 summit. First, vaccinate the world by enhancing equitable access to vaccines and getting shots in arms as quickly as possible. Number two, save lives now by solving the oxygen shortage and making COVID tests, therapeutic medicine, and personal protective equipment widely available. Third, build back better by establishing a sustainable health security financing mechanism and demonstrating political leadership to prepare for and prevent future pandemics. And finally, calling the world to account by aligning our common global targets, tracking progress, and supporting one another in fulfilling our commitments. As, as many of you know, the United States did not originally join the COVAX Alliance for Vaccine Dis Distribution, but we are working to make up for lost time. We are today the single largest donor of free vaccine worldwide. We have distributed 283 million doses to 110 countries around the world, mostly through the COVAX Alliance. And we are continuing to work with partners to increase the quantity of vaccine as well as the pace of delivery. Our donations are entirely free with no payment expected from recipient countries and no political strings attached. We fully support the WHO's goal to vaccinate at least 70% of the world by 2022. In every country and in every income category with quality, safe, and effective vaccine. The United States has already shipped almost 100 million vaccine doses to countries in Africa, for example, and more will be on the way soon. A coordinated effort to boost production, increase vaccine donation, and fulfill our commitments to COVAX are all interventions that, need, that are needed to vaccinate the world. We also must address the challenges of safely storing and delivering millions of doses of vaccine, of combating disinformation, and of supporting healthcare workers who have been working beyond capacity for nearly two years. Let me say a word about India. India is the largest vaccine manufacturer on the planet and a critical global partner in addressing this pandemic. Even before COVID, India produced more than 60% of the world's vaccines. Indian vaccine manufacturers are partnering today with multiple international pharmaceutical and research institutions to develop, test, and manufacture the world's vaccines. Building on our partnership with India, the Quad COVID-19 Response and Relief Partnership will support and manufacture uh, safe and effective vaccines in India. Quad partners are financing, and India is bringing online capacity to produce 1 billion additional doses of COVID-19 vaccine by the end of next year. And we will continue to work together with India to ensure that this expanded production is delivering vaccine to the Indo-Pacific and around the world. Elsewhere in the Indian Ocean region, the White House also coordinated with the African Union to facilitate the purchase of up to 110 million doses of COVID vaccine from the company Moderna. And Moderna is working in parallel to create local manufacturing facilities in Africa with the goal of producing up to 500 million doses of vaccine each year. Let me end by saying combating the global pandemic requires all of us to work in partnership to share information, to share our expertise, and to share our limited resources. We in the United States will continue to deliver on our commitments to share doses of vaccine, to scale manufacturing, and to invest in vaccines abroad. We look forward to working with partners around the Indian Ocean Rim to defeat, to defeat this pandemic and to keep our communities safe. Thank you all.
look forward to any questions. Thank you, Ambassador Lou. Um, I hope you are able to stay back uh, for a few minutes because I'm sure uh, there are colleagues of ours who have uh, comments or questions. Uh, uh, do you have a few minutes to be with us? Uh, absolutely. The sun is just rising here in uh, Virginia. I have lots of time. That, 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 that's great. So, uh, Sri Ram uh, from your side, please. Uh, thank you, Secretary Lou, for uh, joining uh, on a, in, in the holiday season, on a weekend morning at 7 a.m. We are sorry we gave you a lot of trouble to insist on virtual <laughs> presence. It's, it's my pleasure. It's an honor to be here. Uh, you have focused uh, uh, your comments on uh, pandemic control largely. Uh, since yesterday, the discussions here have also focused on another important aspect that is uh, climate uh, control related issues. While pandemic has hit the economies in our region very badly, uh, climate control related targets are also causing anxiety to many countries. Uh, there is greater expectation from the developed world that uh, it should loosen its strings more. $100 billion target is not really sufficient. Uh, there should be more support forthcoming from the developed uh, uh, countries, developed West, towards uh, you know helping uh, developing countries in our region in uh, you know addressing or meeting the climate goals. Uh, do you think that? Uh, uh, do you agree that 100 billion is not a sufficient target, and we need to revise it quickly? Uh, thank you for that question. Really important. I, I, I certainly agree with you that more is required, including more uh, from the West in terms of supporting both um, adaptation to climate, but also climate uh, change prevention. I, I was recently in the Maldives and in Nepal. Uh, I was uh, impressed in both countries by how seriously the leaders of those countries are taking the climate challenge. In the Maldives, uh, when you spend just a day there, right at sea level, everything is at sea level, you realize what is at stake. In Nepal, you see the forest fires, you see the flooding, you see the, the glaciers melting right before your eyes. I, I do think in the Indian Ocean region, we can see the effect of climate change every day. And uh, I can tell you right now, colleagues in the Maldives are looking forward to having um, some influx of infrastructure money to help to adapt their islands so they will survive this change. Even at one and a half percent increase in the temperature of the climate, they will lose many of their 180 islands unless we can act together. In Nepal, they are very much looking forward to helping, having the world help them use their incredible hydroelectric and solar potential to help um, provide energy to the whole region. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in the work being done uh, around the world to help developing countries. Without the support of the de developing world, there is no way that we will reach our climate targets. I, I, we in the United States should do more. All of us working together should do more. I completely agree with your premise. I see a hand from the back. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, I'm sure you. My question was, uh, I mean, you started about uh, vaccination drives and you talked about vaccine rollouts and everything. Uh, U.S. took a very long time, sir, when India and South Africa put forth a motion for the TRIPS waiver that we talk about. And even now, there is lack of substantive action in terms of persuading EU to sort of help in getting the vaccines across at a much faster rate. So my question is this, sir. Will you, I mean, you've done the talking bit, you've talked the talk, but will you walk the walk, sir? It's a great question. Um, for everyone else, the TRIPS waiver, you may know, is uh, an attempt uh, by many countries, including the United States, to get um, intellectual property relief for technologies related to vaccine production for COVID-19 as well as therapeutic medicine. 
Uh, the United States today strongly supports the TRIPS waiver. I was in meetings at the highest level of our government with the, uh, the representatives of the European Union just on Friday, talking about how we might work together, both on the TRIPS waiver, but also in looking at um, trying to increase production of vaccines and therapeutics for the developing world. It is very much a priority of ours. Uh, what you can see and I can see is progress is moving very slowly in the WTO. And so I think more action will need to be taken for that to be successful. And we as, um, as partner countries should not only be working through the WTO, we should be working individually with, with our companies to have them step forward to provide um, the medicines we need to make sure that we're going to uh, end this pandemic. Thank you. I'll take one final question before we let Ambassador Lu go and we move to the other panelists. Yes, please. So this is Apoor Mishra from India Foundation. My question to you, to you is about the third pillar of our conference, which is the economy. And one fault line that the pandemic exposed is, is the vulnerability of our global supply chains. I think the phrase that yeah. Dr. Jay Shankar used yesterday was over-centralized globalization. Is this an area of concern for you going forward? And how is the United States government thinking about diversifying global supply chains, especially on critical commodities that drive the global economy? Thank you. So um, in the United States, we are feeling this very profoundly right now. It's the holiday season here. And my daughter and I, when we finish this, uh, are going shopping to get ready for um, our Christmas and New Year's holidays. And um, there's real inflation here. Uh, there is a real bottleneck in terms of um, supply chain coming into the United States. I know many economies are feeling that today. Uh, our, our president has worked very hard on the transport part of that bottleneck. Part of that bottleneck in the US is about our port system and the, and the workers that we need to, um, to have employees at the ports. So we're fixing that part. But what uh, Minister Jashankar talked about is you know, where in the world are we making the critical elements of the, of the um, consumer goods uh, that we need to have a reliable supply chain? One of the things I know India is focused on is silicon chips, right? What was the last thing we bought that didn't have a silicon chip in it? Everything now... I was just at the store the other day, and they have these refrigerators with huge digital screens on the front that talk to you and do these amazing things. They will only do those amazing things if they have the silicon inside. And one of the things that we are very excited about is uh, Minister Jashankar's proposal that we diversify where those chips are made. Today, they're made in four or five places in the world, there have been some terrible fires, as well as um, disruptions from the COVID-19 pandemic that has resulted in this crazy um, chip shortage. I, I, my family and I moved back to the United States. We had to buy cars. There are no cars to buy because we can't find them because they require so many computer chips now to operate a vehicle. Um, I, I, I am a big believer that in the next five to 10 years, we need to have dozens of countries producing this sort of high technology. Uh, we are looking to partner with India as a, a starting point because India already has such tremendous capacity. But what I know is it won't be enough for the Americans and the Indians to partner together. We need to partner with Singapore. We need to partner with Taiwan, places which are already producing this sort of technology and are gonna be able to help our economy scale up very, very quickly. Thank you for that great question. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate your taking the time out to be with us uh, from Washington. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, maybe from the United States, we move to Australia because uh, our friend from Turkey wishes to speak last. He wants to have the last word, so we'll, we'll, we'll let him have that. Um, uh, Warren, uh, you want to put forth an Australian perspective? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. 
I'll just check that everyone can hear me. I think that's working. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, to uh, your excellencies, ministers, um, higher than ministers, in fact, I think, members of parliament, ambassadors, other distinguished colleagues and friends. Uh, thank you very much for inviting, actually, my foreign minister, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Minister for Women, Senator Maurice Payne, to address this fifth Indian Ocean Conference. Uh, very unfortunately, um, Minister Payne regrets that she's not able to attend, uh, which was owing to the very kinds of disruptions that we've been talking about um, earlier today, uh, particularly those caused by the latest variant of COVID. I'd like to congratulate the India Foundation on the distinguished and, and its partners here in the UAE, um, on the very distinguished and diverse range of participants in this program for yesterday and today. And I'd look, like to also acknowledge the important role of the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, the host of this conference, and of course, congratulate the United Arab Emirates on its uh, jubilee, golden jubilee uh, on this weekend just past. I'd, I would like to speak today about uh, the importance of the Indian Ocean region to Australia in particular, uh, Australia's engagement with that region, uh, and also touch a bit on what we are doing about COVID in this region and also environmental issues in this region. Uh, that this region, the Indian Ocean, is vitally important to Australia should be self-evident. It's home to <clears throat> two of our uh, most important and thriving cities, Darwin and Perth, and also several territories of Australia in the Indian Ocean, including Christmas Island, the Cocos Keeling Islands, and Heard and MacDonald Islands. It includes the vast majority of Australia's search and rescue region, and most of its exclusive economic zone. And it hosts the ports that ship about half of our nation's exports. For these reasons, and for many others, Australia doesn't consider itself so much an Asia-Pacific country, which was the formulation which previously it used to use a lot, but rather an Indo-Pacific country. For us, the Indo-Pacific terminology uh, as, and concept makes more sense as a geostrategic concept. Um, as a region, uh, as a country, bordering on two great oceans and, of course, uh, the Indian Ocean. Uh, the Indian Ocean is, the center, is at the center of many important global affairs. It's home to half of the world's population and the world's most dynamic economies and busiest sea lanes. What happens in the Indian Ocean region resonates everywhere in the world. That's why Australia seeks an Indian Ocean, uh, Indian Indo-Pacific region that is open, inclusive and resilient underpinned by rules, norms, and respect for sovereignty. The government focuses a great deal of attention on the Indo-Pacific. It has, in the last couple of years, overseen a step change in Australia's relations with many of the countries of Southeast Asia, in particular, as seen, for example, in the declaration of a comprehensive strategic partnership between ASEAN and Australia this October. And we've seen many uh, in very important advances in our relations with important countries in the Indian Ocean. Um, for example, um, a very significant new level of cooperation between Australia and India. And uh, to take another example, a trade and investment facilitation arrangement with Bangladesh. We also continue to actively engage the members of the region through uh, the, including other things, the Indian Ocean Rim Association, or EORA. Uh, for example, uh, the Perth-based EORA Blue Carbon Hub, a scientific institution which brings together scientists from the region to develop literal states' capabilities to preserve and maintain coastal mangroves, tidal marshes, and seagrasses. Um, in other areas as well, as a coordinator of women's empowerment, women's economic empowerment within EORA. Australia has helped to offer practical pathways to improve economic outcomes for women in responding to the COVID pandemic. Australia has also co-founded a symposium along with the United States, uh, which is a EORA dialogue partner, to provide advice to female entrepreneurs in the Indian Ocean region uh, on <clears throat> how to adapt to new business paradigms brought about by the COVID pandemic. Uh, I think that uh, 
as we look to the future, we're seeking to bolster our support to existing and new groupings and mechanisms that can help develop Indian Ocean cooperation. One of those is, of course, the aura that I've spoken about. There are other groupings, structures, and methods of cooperation that all have the potential to be important and to add value. Um, in addition to the importance of, of structure, um, however, what also is important is the objectives and values that underpin um, whatever form of cooperation we take forward. There's been some reference earlier um, amongst the panel to the Quad, amongst Australia, India, Japan, and the United States. Um, this is a, a group that focuses on many important issues. Um, it, it has an interest in the Indian Ocean, of course, and it has those countries in the Quad have a very positive and practical agenda to make the Indo-Pacific region more resilient, more inclusive, and open. These efforts, uh, which the Quad supports, but which underpin everything that Australia in particular does in its Indian Ocean diplomacy, are about strengthening the sovereignty and the agency of our Indo-Pacific partners. Our vision is about building a region in which members can resist coercion, fight disinformation, and ensure that freedoms of navigation and overflight are respected. It's about creating sustainable livelihoods and protecting our environment. And it is also about human rights and ensuring equal opportunities for women and girls. And about overall ensuring the rules-based order that has served us so well in the past continues into the future. I would like to talk a little bit in a little bit more detail about two particular issues and in the context of Indian Ocean cooperation, what we are doing in relation to the COVID pandemic and also environment issues. COVID has been a major focus of our Indian Ocean engagement. Australia has committed to sharing 60 million COVID vaccine doses with countries in Southeast Asia and the Pacific by the end of 2022. We have already shared over 9.2 million doses across the region since March. We're supporting partner governments in the region to put in place the distribution, training, and support needed to deliver vaccine doses, including through our regional vaccine access and health security initiative. We're also improving the region's access to safe, effective, and affordable vaccines through the advanced market commitment of the COVAX facility and we're supporting regional countries with their vaccine rollouts in partnership with the World Health Organization, UNICEF, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and others. Through the Quad Vaccines Partnership, again, Australia, India, Japan, and the United States, through that partnership, uh, an additional one billion vaccine doses will be produced by the end of 2022. Australia has pledged $100 million to support their delivery to Southeast Asia, the delivery of vaccines to Southeast Asia. It's also worth noting that in this work, <clears throat> India has been a very important partner of Australia. And I think it's only right that during the devastating Delta variant wave that spread through our region, that we can in some way repay India's generosity as, as it were, the pharmacy to the world by providing a number of things, including ventilators, personal protective equipment, concentrators, funding, emergency supplies, and other things to India, as well as to India's important neighbors, such as Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and the Maldives. In relation to environment, our support and engagement will continue next year in ways that will promote sustainability of our vital and shared, shared asset, the Indian Ocean. We are committed to deepening our cooperation with our Indian Ocean partners to mitigate the destabilizing effects of climate change. Through our Oceans Leadership Package, Australia is investing in practical action to restore, conserve, and account for blue carbon ecosystems. This complements our additional funding to the Perth-based Eora Blue Carbon Hub that I mentioned previously. We're proud to be partnering with India in leading the marine ecology pillar of the, Indi uh, the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, which was announced by Prime Minister Modi in, at the 2019 East Asia Summit. And also earlier this year, Senator Payne, our foreign minister, announced the first recipients of the Australia-India Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative Partnership Grant Program. 
Their work will help to identify ways to improve trade connectivity and maritime transport in the region and uh, ocean accounting and the risks and look at to, to look at the risks and opportunities in deep seabed mining. We strongly believe that a sustainable ocean economy requires careful management and protection of the marine environment. Important to this are robust maritime information centres, which make an important contribution to regulating ocean activities, allowing for safe transit of trade, or combating illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. That's why Australia will continue to support the Information Fusion Centre for the Indian Ocean region near New, near New Delhi, where Australia also has a liaison officer. And finally, our South Asia Regional Connect in Infrastructure Connectivity Program is supporting a pipeline of transport and energy projects which connect the economies of the region, of South Asia in particular. So, um, distinguished colleagues and friends, in conclusion, um, it's clear that the Indian Ocean is a vibrant and diverse region full of opportunity and certainly one that is front of mind for the Australian Government. The Australian government remains steadfast in its obligation to keep this region healthy, prosperous and secure for the benefit of all. We've always been a part of this region. Our deep ties at present will continue to drive our engagement based on principles of respect and collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Warren. You want to stay? Okay, please. Um, I'm mindful that we're running against the clock, so maybe we'll take just one question on Australia from the floor, if there's something uh, pressing with anyone. Yes, the lady at the back. Use the mic, please. Uh, I'm Hamsa from India Foundation. And my question is, uh, we've had uh, general consensus that everybody agrees to a rule-based order in the Indian Ocean, but the rules that we have as we speak today is the UNCLOS, and we've seen that it's failed uh, most nations in the challenges that we face today. So uh, do we, what does Australia see this? Uh, wh where do you stand on this? Uh, Sorry, I think that you're, you're asking me about the fact that despite our commitment to a rules-based order, that doesn't stop certain countries crossing uh, or, or contradicting a rules-based order, and what is it that we can do about that? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, essentially the answer is to continue doing what we are doing and to, um, as far as possible, uh, uh, deepen the bonds of cooperation that we've already developed, expand and intensify the agenda, uh, within groups uh, such as the ones that I mentioned and, and within other contexts as well uh, to, to broaden the discussion, um, to make sure, and also in particular to make sure that the voices of the region itself are very clearly heard. Um, I think that it's very important uh, to remember that when we're talking about challenges to the rules-based order, um, this is not simply a question of some external countries coming and doing something that uh, you know another external country doesn't like. Um, what we are talking about is challenges to, as I said, the sovereignty and agency of the countries in the region itself. Um, and so this is, this this discussion and this objective is really about um, uh, drawing out the voices from the region um, as much as possible. And that is one of the reasons why um, Australia takes the leading role that it does in groups like EORA and, and others. Thank you. Um, may I turn to the Deputy Chief of Mission from Bangkok, from, <laughs> from Abu Dhabi actually, to give us the view from Bangkok. I go now? Yes, please. Honorable Chair, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates. Uh, first of all, please allow me to uh, join our delegates in expressing the appreciation to the Government of Sri Lanka, Government of the United Arab Emirates, and the India Foundation for hosting this fifth edition of Indian Ocean Conference and maintaining the momentum of this uh, important forum. Since our last conference in uh, 2019, the world has changed uh, tremendously. 
and outgoing pandemic remains at the forefront of our concerns, together, together with the looming threats such as uh, environmental uh, degradation and runaway climate change, which posted unprecedented challenges to the region and beyond. Against this backdrop, the, ocean, the Indian Ocean region remains at the crossroads of global maritime trade and has great potential to serve as an important venue of cooperation to promote economic growth and recovery in the coming future. While we move towards a post-COVID-19 uh, era, the Indian Ocean Conference role in uh, promoting exchanges and, co and collaboration in the Indian Ocean could contribute substantially in fostering a peaceful and sustainable environment to our full uh, recovery. Therefore, this year's uh, conference theme, uh, ecology, economy, and uh, epidemic is therefore timely and encompasses all the important issues. With this theme in mind, I wish to share Thailand's outlook in enhancing regional cooperation to tackle uh, our common challenges as follow. Uh, first, promoting a sustainable development uh, para, uh, paradigm. Like many countries in this forum, and as we heard many speakers before, Thailand's national security and economic prosperity are very much dependent on a sustainable uh, maritime environment. Because with over uh, 320,000 square kilometers of, mar of maritime territory, uh, both in the Gulf of Thailand and the, the Andaman Sea in the uh, Indian Ocean, contributes to over 118 billion US dollars to the local and national economy. Thailand attaches great importance to promoting the right balance between the utilization and preservation of marine environment through the concept of uh, blue economy. And in line with the concept of blue economy, Thailand is currently promoting the, the uh, what we call bio-circular green economy model or the BCG uh, development scheme that utilizes technologies and innovations to create an environmentally sustainable path for businesses and economic growth. Uh, secondly, promoting inclusive dialogue for cooperation. To achieve a sustainable post-COVID-19 recovery, we must strengthen the role of the private sector, especially the SMEs, in revitalizing the economy. Uh, in this connection, Thailand has signed the uh, Indian Ocean Rim Association, or IORA, a memorandum of understanding for the promotion of small and medium enterprises. Uh, we hope that this MOU will help pave the way for stronger networking and cooperation between SMEs in the region. Also, Thailand, as a member of various uh, regional and sub-regional economic frameworks, has been active, actively promoting cooperation in various forums, including IORA, BIMSTEC, ASEM, and ASEAN. And furthermore, uh, during Thailand's chairmanship of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, for the, for the upcoming year in uh, 2022, under the, under the theme Open Connect Balance, Thailand will continue to further promote cooperation within the, with the uh, Indian Ocean region and beyond. Third, uh, promoting cooperation on the mitigation of the impact from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, Thailand firmly believes that equitable and timely access to COVID-19 vaccines in the short term and the resumption of safe cross-border travel in the long term are the most effective strategies in mitigating the effects of COVID-19 and in achieving a sustainable economic recovery. Several countries in ASEAN, including Thailand, are also working on the development of homegrown, homegrown vaccines against COVID-19. Thailand rem remains committed to facilitating and, and encouraging exchanges of best practices and cooperation among counterparts to turn the tides of COVID-19 challenges and to ensure that no one is left behind in this pandemic. Fourth and lastly, uh, promoting a conducive environment for cooperation. It is indeed difficult to foster a peaceful environment without providing a common understanding and guiding principle in managing uh, maritime security and other issues in the Indian Ocean. As many countries are defining their policies toward the Indian Ocean region, 
Uh, Thailand remains committed to the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific uh, framework, AOIP, and welcomes the adoption of the ASEAN-India joint statement on cooperation on the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific for peace, stability, and prosperity in the region on the 28th October uh, this year, which marks an important step in fostering a framework and environment of cooperation in the future. Excellencies, distinguished uh, delegates, uh, the past two years have been a challenging experience for all of us. The interconnected world that we took for granted has been shaken to the core. Nevertheless, the crisis has further reflected the importance of collect collective action as we embark upon a, new jo a long journey toward post-COVID-19 uh, recovery. On our part, Thailand stands ready to join hands with our counterparts and the international community to make the Indian Ocean a region, a region of peace, sustainability, and prosperity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. May I now invite uh, Professor Mehmet, uh, founder of the Turkish think tank, Ankasam, uh, to speak. Thanks a lot, dear chairman. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, colleagues, I would like to thank, to a special thanks to the Indian Foundation for giving me this opportunity to make a speech, and also kindly thanks to the United Arab Emirates for their hospitality and generosity. It is a pleasure for me to be here. I will try to put my speech under the title of the, the rise of the Indo-Pacific in the new geopolitic, geopolitics of Asia. As it is well known, the international system is in the process of new construction in this period when the center of power shifts from the West to Asia or the Asian powers have begun more effectively in the construction of the new world order. Transportation corridor, corridors once again come to the fore with their decisive role. Without any doubt that one of the significant geopolitical areas that rise to prominence in this trans transition process, which will largely determine the name and actors of the new international system, is the Indian Ocean, which forms the backbone of the Indo-Pacific axis. In order to understand the Indian Ocean geopolitics more clearly and to see its importance, we need to briefly express on the new Asian geopolitics and the latest developments shaping it in this context. In this sense, the subjects below can be mentioned. The first issue that comes to fore in the new Asian geopolitics is undoubtedly the Afghanistan problem. This geopolitical vacuum and the terrorist threat that emerged after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. In this threat cannot be controlled. If this threat cannot be controlled, it has the capacity to affect all of Asia, on which centered Central Asia, South, es South Asia, especially China and Russia. Starting from the Baltics, the Russia's problem, which is de declining economically, and militarily in the Black Sea, Caucasus, and Central Asia is a line, has been gaining importance in the new Asian geopolitics day by day. The economic collapse in Iran and the wrong political moves it has made within the context of domestic and foreign policy in the recent period are another important development. China-Pakistan friendship has a special place in the new Asian geopolitics. China's domestic and foreign policy problems caused by rapid extreme growth, extreme growth have the capacity to affect not only the future of the new Asian geopolitics, but also the future of the international system. Lastly, the organization of Turkic states, which is in the process of being established, also comes to the fore in the new Asian geopolitics. As I, as I have just stated, an accurate evolution cannot be made in the Indo-Pacific Indo without considering these topics in the new Asian geopolitics. 
which can all be conference topics, as you predict. Therefore, these developments highlight the Indo Indian Ocean as a safer route for India and the related regional states. The Indian Ocean has once again turned into an area of geopolitical interest and competition. And this issue has started to be decisive in world politics since the last two years of Donald Trump. At this stage, the Indian Ocean emerges as a hybrid area of power struggles in the context of land and sea powers. In this context, the Indian Ocean can also be expressed as the world's most valuable hybrid line or the Golden Corridor, stretching from the Mediterranean to the Middle East and the Pacific region. In other words, Indian Ocean can be described as the heartland or Eurasia of the seas in terms of geopolitics. One of the prominent power centers in this geopolitical line is undoubtedly India, which has a dynamic and young, young population nearly 1.3 billion. As one of the most significant actors of change process in terms of geopolitical, geoeconomic, and geostrategic, India is the sixth largest economy in the world with its economy of $2.7 trillion. Thanks to his economic capacity, India is among the states that constitute the largest production power in Asia and the world. Like other existing and potential power centers, India's future large, largely passes through corridors that can carry its economy to the world more effectively and safely with its foreign trade and import the energy resources it needs primarily oil and gas. In this context, India wants to reach Europe with the shortest and most cost-effective route. New Delhi has several options in this regard. The first of these is the International North-South Transport Corridor, established in the early 20s, 2000s. The second option is the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, established between India and Japan, emphasizing the Ocean Red Sea Mediterranean Line. The third is the Arab Med Corridor, which opens the Mediterranean through India, the United Arab Emirates, and Israel, created in the Middle East region. However, one of the prominent topics regarding corridors in recent times is ensuring security. For this reason, states want to reach markets through geographies that they consider safe and where the risk of conflict is low. Recent developments in the context of the Middle East, Iran, and Afghanistan have led to the change and diversification of India's geopolitical choices. As it is known, for many years India remained loyal to the economic corridors opening to the Caucasus, Russia, and Europe via Iran. At the same time, it tried to develop transportation corridors with Iran and Afghanistan in order to open up the Central Asia. However, the emergence of some difficulties and obstacles in the transportation corridors going north through Iran led New Delhi to look new options. A same difficulty has emerged in Afghanistan. After the Taliban seized power in Afghanistan in August 2021, India had to revise its existing corridor proje projects. There are some difficulties and rivals in front of India's opening to the Mediterranean through the Middle East. It is seen that incompleted the railway, railway and highway lines and ports in Iran, security risks in, in the corridor reaching the north, China's relations and expansions with the countries located the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, and the Middle East Mediterranean centered countries have influenced India and pushed its foreign policy for new search. In this context, it it is of great importance for India can both sell their own goods to the world and ensure the security of these goods. Therefore, India seems to have begun to focus on the Arab Mad Corridor, which extends to Gulf and from there to Eastern Mediterranean and eventually connects to Europe. There is no doubt that United Arab Emirates' geopolitical position and power as a safe and stable port for India, for India is reality that cannot be ignored. It is also known that India's close relations with the United Arab Emirates have been affecting the choice of India. The most important indicator of this is that the trade volume between two countries reached $60 billion in 2020, and the United Arab Emirates is India's third largest partner. However, it is possible to say that the relations will develop further in the future, 
In a report published by International Energy Agency in February 2021, it is predicted that India will surpass China in global energy demand by 2040, and it is dependence on Middle East Middle Eastern oil will increase from 75% to over 90%. The fact that India ranks second in oil exports of the United Arab Emirates after China increases the strategic importance of oil producing countries such as the United Arab Emirates. Within the framework of the win-win approach of the two actors is not just for India-United Arab, United Arab Emirates relations, along with New Delhi's West Asia Mediterranean Sea Corridor stretching from the Indian Ocean to Europe. It will also accelerate economic, political, and social relations on the Europe, Caucasus, Central Asia, Afghanistan line. In this context, I can already express that the United Arab Emirates can play a very critical, facilitating, and constructive role. The latest steps, achievements, and important collaborations of the United Arab Emirates in foreign policy point out this. The United Arab Emirates and New Delhi can find a zone for, for expansion and cooperation in Eurasia and secure corridors for strategic resource needs and commercial activities. Today, the way of, the way of establishing strong cooperation amongst countries is passing through the development of economic and commercial relations. And India, opening to the Middle East through the United Arab Emirates, will become a major actor that strengthens its cooperation in the region thanks to the economic power and contribution of the United Arab Emirates. Besides, with the contribution it provides to the economies of the countries and the support it gives to their infrastructure, New Delhi will be accepted as a global power and an important ally with the geostrategies, geostrategic alliances it will establish. And in order to express once again, the United Arab Emirates will be one of the most important countries that pave the way for New Delhi here. Because the United Arab Emirates, with its strong economy, entrepreneurial spirit, geopolitical and strategic advantages and cooperation is rewarded in a much wider and deeper geography. The potential of different cultures and values to come together, specifically in India and the United Arab Emirates, shouldn't be ignored. In this respect, the United Arab Emirates and the India appear as two great Indian Ocean ocean partners that complement each other in the construction of regional peace, stability, prosperity, and welfare. To put, to put it more concretely, the United Arab Emirate, Emirates, which has the potential to be an important pole in the corridor stretching from the Indo-Pacific to Europe, can become the center of regional trade and cooperation and become the main carrier country on the Pacific Indo-Mediterranean route. Undoubtedly, India will have the secure resources and corridors it needs for its economy, and in this context, it will have strong cooperation and partners. Thanks to the opening economic relations between the United Arab Emirates and India, strategic cooperation and regional balance factor, factors in the in Indo-Pacific region will become more valuable by addressing to a wider geography and actors. Because an atmosphere where everyone wins will create the best secret environment, we can call a win-win. As a result, the United Arab Emirates plays a leading role in India's corridor stretching ag across the Gulf to the west. In this regard, Abu Dhabi stands a key position in the Indo-Persian Gulf line and in the geopolitics of enlarged Asia. Moreover, the United Arab Emirates is one of the strongest countries in the Gulf with its business, mind, infrastructure, and uh, capability. The corridor extending from India to the, uh, to the United Arab Emirates has the capacity to create a global impact, especially with its contribution to the integration of South Asia, the Gulf, the Middle East, and Europe. In order for this effect to be faster and more effective, new line arrangements can be made within this route. The serious tension in the Eastern Mediterranean and the rising terror and immigration wave from Afghanistan 
are leading India to seek a more inclusive and realistic corridor. In this respect, India can raise its position in global politics thanks to the United Arab Emirates, which offer road both to the West and the North. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you, Professor Mehmet. I was hoping that we would have time for some informal interaction between the panelists, but I think we've run against the clock. So much uh, against my desire, I'm going to take up the mic myself and uh, follow uh, uh, Mr. Ram Adav's um, advice and try in a few words to sum up uh, what the last couple of days have been about. I must uh, start, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, by um, thanking Sri Ram Madhav, not just for inviting me for this conference, but giving me this uh, uh, rather doubtful pleasure of doing the closing, uh, because he made sure that I was not able to leave a single session uh, to meet some of my Emirati friends. Uh, so I think this was quite a well-planned move by the India Foundation Secretary to make sure I was tied to the, uh, to the chair. Um, it's not easy to, uh, to, to try and sum up in a few minutes the uh, very rich deliberations that we've had uh, over the uh, four plenary sessions and indeed the two uh, pre-conference uh, workshops that uh, took place yesterday. But uh, it is clear that there was a complete agreement on the three E's that this conference chose as its title. Uh, ecology, economy, and the epidemic as the three most pressing challenges for the Indian Ocean uh, region. The fact that these three shouldn't be taken on their own, uh, the fact that there are so many points of intersection uh, between ecology and economics, between the uh, epidemic and economics, uh, that you have to take uh, perforce a holistic and integrated view when you uh, uh, formulate ideas and policies. And I think that's what we heard from several of our distinguished speakers over uh, the last day and a half. There's no doubt that COVID-19 uh, in its various uh, mutations has had a devastating impact on the global economy, but also it came out that that impact has been unequal that developing countries, the less developed countries, have borne really a disproportionate share of that, uh, of that uh, impact, uh, the cost of the lockdowns, um, the uh, emergence of uh, Omicron, uh, again, as proof that uh, the virus is still very much around and we need to find ways to live with it, to deal with it. Vaccinations as the answer for some of us, perhaps booster doses after the vaccination as an answer. But what about the inequity of this? Uh, what about the fact that many countries in Africa are still in single digits when it comes to the uh, percentage of population that has been vaccinated? Uh, what about the fact that in, 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 in Europe and North America, some countries have hoarded enough doses that could have vaccinated millions in the less developed countries. Uh, and yet, we see countries trying to run expensive campaigns to fight vaccine hesitancy in, 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 in their own borders, uh, while being much less mindful about the pressing need to uh, share those vaccines uh, across uh, other countries. We've had some fascinating inputs on the economic impact of COVID, not just the health impact of the, uh, of the virus. Um, the disruption to education as a key point that emerged. Uh, the fact that it has diverted a disproportionate uh, percentage of resources to health. Um, the consequent shrinking of uh, resources available for other pressing development needs, uh, particularly in the context of economies that have shrunk uh, over the last two years, and the real challenge of even reaching back pre-COVID levels in terms of per capita incomes in, 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 in some countries. 
So there's no question that the COVID-19 has been a huge setback to the ambitious targets that we had set ourselves globally to meet the sustainable development uh, goals. Um, yes, uh, various countries have spoken about uh, building back differently. Uh, President Biden has spoken about build back better. But where are the resources going to come from? Um, I think um, we heard earlier in the afternoon that if even that $100 billion target that was set several years back uh, has not been uh, met, uh, then where are we going to find the rest of the resources that, uh, that, that are needed to, to, uh, uh, for this purpose? Um, climate change came up very strongly as a major existential challenge for uh, countries in the Indian Ocean uh, region. The fact that the Indian Ocean is warming up much faster, perhaps three times faster than the Pacific Ocean was, was, was brought out, uh, and the, uh, uh, the consequent impact of uh, much more frequent and much more extreme weather events. In fact, the fact that we are having this conference at a time when the east coast of India is uh, facing the challenge of the Jawad um, cyclonic storm is a, a case in point. There was recognition that COP26 made some progress, but nowhere close to what is the need of the hour. Um, the climate justice which is demanded by uh, the developing world, by the global south, uh, needs far more resources than are being made available at this point of time. So how do countries go about with ideas and plans to build more resilient infrastructure, to mitigate uh, uh, the uh, cost and impact of uh, weather uh, events, uh, and to build a more sustainable blue economy, which is so vital for so many of the Indian Ocean uh, member states? Um, yes, you could look at innovative uh, financial instruments, and uh, there was a very interesting discussion about blue bonds and green bonds, uh, and how you could try and uh, really walk that particular talk of uh, uh, putting investment resources into, uh, into those areas. But also this somewhat depressing recognition that we are a long ways away from meeting those goals. The challenges are staring us in the face right here and now, but the resources uh, that are needed for those are not yet quite visible on the horizon. In the context of uh, the sustainable uh, blue economy, some very strong uh, views uh, came up about the need for resolute measures to stop extraterritorial overfishing, particularly by these giant commercial trawlers and factory ships, uh, the need to protect coral reefs instead of dredging them up to create artificial islands, and more broadly, the need to respect the ocean that gives us so much. The need to create norms for transport of hazardous materials particularly in the context of avoiding environmental disasters of the kind that happened with the um, beaching of the Express Pearl. On the economy, two years after the virus struck the, or was discovered at least, or announced to the world, uh, we find that ports are clogged, containers are piled up somewhere, empties are somewhere else, um, and they are disrupted supply chains. Dr. Jay Shankar spoke, and the Foreign Minister of Singapore uh, uh, spoke about the need for a transition from the just-in-time mantra of globalization that we have learned over the last uh, uh, two or three decades to a new uh, paradigm of just-in-case that you are entire manufacturing systems do not have to be built around a just-in-time supply chain uh, mechanism. And then there was this caution about 
unviable projects being taken up uh, with the, the resulting unsustainable debts being piled on and with countries now asking for debt relief, partly because of the ravages of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and partly because of the, uh, uh, the unviability of some of the projects that were uh, thrown up. Because the conference is in the context of the Indian Ocean, Because the con uh, conference is in the context of the Indian Ocean, the sanctity of UNCLOS 82 was repeated several times over as the constitution of the oceans uh, and for the need for all countries to respect the authority of its tribunals and to abide by the awards and judgments of those tri tribunals, even when they do not seem palatable, that is the only way that the rules uh, of the uh, ocean are going to be observed, and certainly the rules of the international community. At least a couple of the speakers brought in the larger dimensions of geopolitics and geoeconomics in which the three E's of ecology, um, economy, and the uh, and pandemic are, are to be, or, or the epidemic are to be framed. Uh, and in that context, and also the context of UNCLOS 82, we spoke about the imperatives of maritime security, of freedom of navigation, and even of the security of undersea communication cables, uh, because we have seen that as an issue that is coming up from time to time. The changing postures of the United States and China, and the potential impact of their rivalry on the Indian Ocean uh, region member states uh, came up, um, as did the erosion of, multi, of trust in multilateral institutions and the in inability of the international community to make these multilateral institutions more relevant to the times in which we live. And hence, perhaps, we are seeing the emergence of minilaterals and plurilaterals like the Quad, which are now setting up increasingly ambitious agendas uh, as we move forward. But there's also this comment that in this, all of this doom and gloom of the, uh, of the climate change imperatives and of the, uh, of the epidemic and its economic impact, perhaps there are also some winds of change that are blowing uh, with some uh, positive trends. The Abraham Accords uh, that are leading to, uh, uh, to the emergence of normal ties between old rivals uh, certainly is a case in point, uh, and the opportunities that it has created, uh, such as the uh, quadrilateral arrangement that we are witnessing between uh, United States, Israel, UAE, and India, and the possibility of UAE as a real bridge between uh, our countries. Uh, but there are others uh, um, that we are witnessing. Uh, I saw reports that uh, the United Arab Emirates National Security Advisor, His Highness Sheikh Tahnoon, may be visiting Tehran tomorrow. Uh, that could be quite a game changer in the region. Uh, and overall, I think what the United Arab Emirates has been trying to articulate in the last four or five months in particular is uh, for the region to try and contain its rivalries within the region and to see if you can shift the focus away from um, internecine uh, squabbles uh, and, and deeper conflicts to, uh, an, uh, to an emphasis on economic cooperation. And that may be something that we are just about beginning to witness uh, in, in this part of the uh, world. There's also um, the other ray of hope, perhaps, which is in emerging technologies. Uh, the fact that uh, um, we are constantly striving for new methods to fight uh, the, uh, the pandemic, uh, some of that came out in the discussions, and uh, there was references to how online education has uh, really made a difference in some countries in bridging the gap uh, left by the pandemic but it also brought out the issue of the digital divide and uh, the fact that those who don't have access to the internet uh, are unable to uh, 
get the benefits of that digital education. So India as a country, uh, which has, uh, I think, thrown up half a dozen unicorns in the education technology space during the course of this year, and with its rock bottom um, internet rates, might be one country that can have some models to uh, offer to other countries in the Indian Ocean, uh, Indian Ocean region, uh, whether those can be replicated. And finally, finally, I think what the conference brought out was this real sense of urgency and that the time for action is now. Uh, we need to be better prepared for the next pandemic, even as we deal with the ravages of this one. Uh, we need to be much more resolute in battling climate change. And there's a crying need for regional and international collaboration. Uh, and perhaps the relevance of this uh, Indian Ocean Conference was reflected in the call that maybe it's time to have it at, as a summit at the level of the leaders of the Indian Ocean region. So it's really been a wonderful exchange of, uh, uh, of uh, ideas, uh, of uh, deliberations over the last day and a half. And with that, it is my privilege to uh, declare that this conference comes to an end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. I'd, I'd now like to move on to um, just presenting a few tokens of appreciation to all our speakers and our moderator. May I request uh, Ms. Rupa Vasudevan to please come up and present uh, a token of appreciation to Ms. Jennifer Larson. Thank you so much, ma'am. May I request Ambassador Stobden to please come up and present a monument to, uh, to Professor Mehmet. Thank you, sir. May I request Ms. Neetu Garg to please come up and present a memento to Mr. Warren King. Thank you, ma'am. May I request Colonel Dini to please come up and present a memento to Mr. Tritt. Thank you, sir. And finally, may I request Mr. Prafulla Ketkar to please come up and present the memento to our moderator, uh, Mr. Navdeep Singh Suri. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to everyone, the chair, the moderator, all our panelists, and uh, to all our participants. Thank you so much. Please uh, 
continue to chat and have fun in Abu Dhabi.